Okay, hello everyone. Well, welcome to uh, our celebration of one third of a century of Mathematica and Wolfram language. So on June 23rd, 1988, we released with some fanfare, the first version of Mathematica. We did it at a press event in Santa Clara, California that happened at, uh, well, the, the big, uh, Presentation started at noon Pacific time on that day. So you might wonder, when is a third of a century since that time? Well, there are different ways to work that out. Does it, is it a question of where the Earth has reached in its orbit? Uh, a, a, a third of a hundred uh, revolutions? Is it a more human question about days of the month, days of the year, and so on? There are different ways to calculate it. The kind of the band of calculations, the sort of first is about um, <clears throat> one hour from now would correspond to that uh, one third century mark. Other calculations would put that one third century of a mark sometime tomorrow. But because uh, today's a Friday and tomorrow's a Saturday, we're gonna celebrate this today. So a third of a century ago, uh, Mathematica came on the scene looking like uh, what we see um, back there. Um, it uh, was running on Macintoshes, Sun workstations, a variety of other kinds of computers. And um, it, uh, uh, it was already running on that computer um, over on, the, on, the, on that side there. Um, that's a next computer. The, that computer was still as a computer under wraps, um, but uh, um, it was already running on that computer just not visible in the world yet. So, and the um, Mathematica version one was very much uh, recognizable to what we have today. Notebooks existed, ins and outs. Uh, many of the functions, many of the core functions we have today were already there. But over the last third of a century, we've built an amazingly tall tower of kind of ideas and technology on top of kind of the core foundational ideas that we first launched a third of a century ago. Now back a third of a century ago, um, this book arrived on bookstore shelves. Um, and uh, this was my original description of Mathematica first described as a system for doing mathematics by computer. Um, this book I think was, um, uh, uh, seemed to be rather successful at communicating to a whole class of people uh, that they could actually compute with their own fingers, so to speak, when in the past they had always assumed that there was nothing sort of high enough level for them to be able to compute this themselves and that they would always have to sort of delegate the process of computation to somebody who would be down in the dungeon somewhere actually dealing with the computer. The, the, the big sort of transformative thing that happened as a result of the release of Mathematica, and it happened rather quickly, was that people like theoretical physicists, mathematicians, things like this, uh, at first those kinds of people um, uh, were, were able to go from thinking of a computation to actually doing a computation directly, and were able to therefore get much further in lots and lots of different areas. And it's been wonderful over the last third of a century to see all the inventions and discoveries that have been made using the technology that we built. So what I wanted to do today was uh, talk a little bit about kind of the, the broader historical context of what we've tried to do, and, um, uh, and then a little bit about what uh, the future might hold for, for the enterprise that we're in. And maybe I should start off by, by showing a few of the kind of artifacts from a third of a century ago. So let me... Um, uh, the invitation to the um, uh, to our um, uh, is this it yes this is it this was the um, invitation that was sent out for our product introduction um, you see the the early spiky there making its appearance and then uh, the the night before June twenty third we were still shrink wrapping these boxes to make Mathematica available at uh, neighborhood software stores, which were a thing in those days. And um, 
the uh, when it's worth worth remembering that um, the the original Mathematica was is compatible with Wolfram language today. If you take a version one notebook, you can run it today and the code will run as well. It will run a lot faster than it did back in those days, but it will still run. And that's, as far as I'm concerned, a substantial achievement, a very unusual achievement in technology to be able to have something with that level of permanence. I think when, when uh, Mathematica first uh, came on the scene, uh, let me see if I can find what I was looking for here. Um, Oh my, okay, here we go. Just to sort of contextualize things, that was the uh, the front cover of InfoWorld uh, computer uh, magazine uh, shortly after um, Mathematica first came out and at deadline, um, you know, news traveled slower back in those days. So that was four days later, uh, was, a, was a story on their front page about, about Mathematica. But it's interesting to see the other things that were going on at the time. It was 8286s and uh, uh, OS2 um, uh, kinds of things and the, the trade-in discounts for IBM PCs and so on. Um, that was kind of the, the state of, of computing at the time. Well, at our product announcement, uh, a third of a century ago, um, this is uh, uh, someone had the the forethought to get a bunch of the people who spoke at the product announcement uh, to sign a, a copy of um, of that book I just showed. So you'll see a few famous signatures there. There's Steve Jobs, um, uh, uh, Gordon Bell, um, uh, well known pioneer of computing, um, also a variety of other people. Um, no one, uh, I could I could tell you all their stories. They're all interesting people with uh, with interesting trajectories um, who were part of um, uh, the product announcement that we did for um, uh, as the founder of Sun Andy Bechtelsheim there, um, and um, and and others, and um, of course we have enough um, uh, enough archiving. Um, uh, capability that, of course, we have the whole list of everybody who was who was there. So, um, and at the time, you know, we we made sort of little flyers about some of the cool things you could do with with Mathematica, whether it was three D graphics, whether it was uh, algebraic computation, those kinds of things. The original story was Mathematica was supposed to be a system for doing mathematics by computer, but that wasn't the conception of it, as far as I was concerned. The conception of it, as far as I was concerned, was make a thing that gets computers to do what I want. And the history of it had been that back in uh, 1979, I had started building a system called SMP, a symbolic manipulation program that was more or less finished in 1981 and started my first company based on it in, in that time. Um, that uh, uh, had been kind of a prototype of how do you think about getting a computer to compute the things you want it to compute as easily for you as possible. And the thing that I was most interested in and sort of the most advanced thing to compute in those days was mathematical kinds of things. And I was much involved in doing uh, theoretical physics at the time. And mathematics was the, the mechanism in those days, at least for doing theoretical physics, uh, my, my subsequent life has, has led me into showing that computation is a, is a deeply relevant paradigm also for, for theoretical physics. But in those days, mathematics was the paradigm for those kinds of things. So the challenge was to make a system that was capable of, uh, as, as, the, um, uh, as the description said, doing mathematics by computer. What was needed to do that? What was needed to, to make the computer do the sophisticated things you could get a computer to do, including mathematics? Well, what I had started doing, and I did this when I started designing SMP, was to do kind of the, the, the thing that you might do as a kind of reductionistic natural science scientist 
on the problem of how to compute things. That is to take the phenomena we observe, the computations we know we want to do, and try and uh, kind of drill down to find the underlying mechanisms, the underlying primitives from which those computations can be built up. In other words, just as one might in physics go down and try and find atoms that make up materials, or now in our modern theories, atoms of space that make up space time and, and so on. So I was interested in finding what were the kind of atoms, the primitives of computation from which you could build up all the computations that people are, are interested in doing. And I, back in, in 1979, 1980 timeframe, I uh, really looked back at the more distant history of the ways people had thought about computation and particularly looked back at the origins of sort of the idea of computation in mathematical logic and so on. And that led me to come up with an approach to thinking about computation that was a bit different to the approach to thinking about computation that was traditional in kind of the way computers did things back even in 1979 and so on. And it was an approach very much based on, well, ultimately the idea of symbolic computation, the idea that you can represent the kinds of computations that one wants to do in terms of symbolic expressions, things like the, 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 the symbol X that doesn't necessarily have to mean anything, but you can choose to have it mean this or that. Um, and then to think about ultimately computation as being a process of transforming symbolic expressions. That wasn't really the model of computation that people typically had in those days. The model of computation was one much more based on this is how a computer is set up. This is how kind of the, the registers in the computer were set up. It's worth realizing back in 1979, even when I was starting to develop SMP, and even to some extent by 1988, developing mathematical, although less so, back in 1979, if you were going to write a really serious program, it would be written in assembly language. It would be written directly, essentially, in the machine code of the machine, uh, directly dealing with questions about where does that data go, which register does it go in, which underlying machine operation are you executing, and those kinds of things. So, in a sense, the the origin of uh, of what I was interested in doing was to build this kind of framework for doing computations that would be as uh, as kind of true to the nature of computation as possible and as convenient for humans to actually use. So I'll talk a little bit more about kind of how that came out, but maybe I should say something about um, sort of the, uh, uh, what, um, um, what, hap what has happened over all these years in the evolution of what uh, was Mathematica on June 23rd, 1988. This is kind of a plot of the um, uh, oops. Um, this is kind of a plot that shows the major areas of the system um, as a function of time through the years from 1988 to today. And what we see is that in the first few years, we're mostly dealing with the, the, the main strength of the core of the system and its kind of mathematical uh, uh, computation capabilities and also its user interface, its notebook interface and so on. Um, there was kind of a slow process. It kind of kind of reminds one of the history of life on Earth, so to speak. There's sort of a slow process of evolution and understanding and so on. And then sometime in the mid-2000s, a Cambrian explosion of lots of different kinds of, of, of capabilities being, being created. And what really happened here was that it became clear over the years that this foundation for representing computational kinds of activities that we had developed uh, in the core language of Mathematica was something on which one could build a huge tower of computational abilities. And parts of that tower were being built in this period here, but really the exposure of all the things that were possible really happened in these, um, uh, in these periods of, uh, uh, around this time. And the, um, that, uh, uh, the, the big thing that really happened, and, and Wolfram Alpha was one of the signs of that happening, was the realization that one could take this kind of foundational idea of symbolic computation and one could uh, use that as a way to represent 
everything in the world computationally, that one could really have a true computational language that represents the kinds of operations, the kinds of things that one is interested in in the world and represent those in computational terms and compute with them. And it wasn't clear that this kind of representation of symbolic expressions and transformations for symbolic expressions and so on, it was certainly not clear that that would be a good representation of sort of everything one can represent computationally in the world, but that's what turned out to be the case. And that's what kind of launched this sort of explosion of capabilities in what was at that time Mathematica. Now, in, in more recent times, we've, uh, we've moved towards talking about what we're doing in terms of Wolfram language, because the, while the original kind of killer app for these kinds of capabilities was mathematical computation, what has emerged is this much broader area of computational language. And so in modern times, we would call what we've done the creation of Wolfram language um, more so than the, than the uh, uh, creation of Mathematica and its development. But so this is kind of a map of what's happened in, in more recent times. Let me. Um, uh, um, let me say that um, uh, if we, let, let's sort of contextualize this a little bit, if we can. Um, oh my. So hoping I had a nice picture that contextualizes this. And let me see if I can find it here. Oh no. Um, improvisation. When in doubt, use one's own technology here. Let me see. Uh, let's do this and here we go. So I want to kind of contextualize what a third of a century means in the history of ideas and technology. And so here we are today, one third of a century ago is 1988. If we go another third of a century back, we get to 1955 and another 1921. What was going on in 1955? Well, 1955 happened to be the year when the first mass produced computers were produced by IBM. And so that was kind of the dawn of of what one could think of as a serious digital electronic computer development. And so it's interesting to realize that today we're the same distance away from the launch of Mathematica as the launch of Mathematica was from the absolute origins of electronic computers. Um, so it's interesting to, to kind of contextualize it that way. And if we go back another third of a century, we get back to kind of the dawn of the concept of computation. And uh, in, in fact, uh, you, can, you can date these things differently. The first kind of um, signs of that were in 1920, the, the development of, of combinators and then post-canonical systems and 1936 Turing machines and so on. Um, but so it was sort of emerging in the 1920s, this kind of idea of computation as an abstract kind of thing. 1955, the emergence of actual electronic computers and then 1988, the emergence of what became our computational language. And in a sense, I see what we did in 1988 as reflecting more back on 1921 than reflecting on 1955. Clearly we needed computers as a practical matter to run what we had in Mathematica, but in a sense, the ideas in Mathematica were more a reflection of sort of the core ideas of computation than they were a reflection on the particulars of electronic computers. Now, it's worth saying that to have a piece of technology and a collection of ideas that survive and prosper for a third of a century is not a trivial thing, and I'm, I'm proud of what we've achieved there. I think what's happened, what I see happening is, we've gradually been building this taller and taller tower of ideas and technology, all built on the kind of core foundational ideas of Mathematica and the Wolfram language that were released in 1988, but we've been building this kind of taller and taller tower. And the thing that's been just amazing over these years is as this tower reaches some point, so we can see further and realize that there is more to build. 
And in a sense, that's led to a rolling to-do list that goes decades into the future. And But it is nevertheless something where we're getting to see kind of the power of those early ideas played out over now a third of a century. And I would say that one thing that I find very satisfying is that uh, although, you know, if you look at, if we ran uh, Mathematica Wolfram language back on a, uh, well, ran it on a, on a, you know, a computer of 1988, um, ran the notebooks and so on, they'll look cruddy for all kinds of reasons to do with the state of computers in those days. But the core language that's there will look as modern as it does today. And it's still kind of a, something that is, in a sense, perfectly modern. It's it's kind of it's modern in the same way that when you unearth that uh, you know ancient icosahedron from ancient Egypt or something that that is a modern shape today just as as a, it was a modern shape in those days. There's a sort of timeless permanence to these kinds of abstractly constructed ideas, and that's what we are making use of in in Wolfram language and in Mathematica. So. Maybe we can say a little bit about, I um, uh, can say a few things about um, kind of the uh, uh, the way I view, well, perhaps we can perhaps we can go back and just look at the even more distant uh, past of things. So going back a century, we get to the dawn of essentially the concept of computation. Let's go back another century. Let's go back to like the 1820s. Well, there we see two things going on. We see um, the uh, two developments, um, actually a little bit later, 1830s to 1840s. Um, one was Charles Babbage and his development of a mechanical computer, a difference engine for computing polynomials, and his, and his sort of conception of an analytical engine, something which would be capable of being told to compute different kinds of things, not just a very particular set of polynomials. And then Ada Lovelace's realization based on that, that you could in a sense compute anything. You could uh, uh, weave algebraical patterns and compose music and do all these other kinds of things um, with, uh, with the analytical engine. Well, the analytical engine was never actually built but its concept existed in the 19, in the 1840s, and that was kind of the one century back. That's that's what we have. The other development at that time was was George Boole and his realization that logic, which had been invented by Aristotle back uh, in antiquity, that logic, which had been more of a kind of linguistically described thing, a thing that was a sort of characterization of the types of valid linguistic arguments that you could make that logic could be cast into a more formal, more mathematical form that we would now call Boolean algebra. So those were, and those were sort of two, two different sort of threads of, 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 of precursor. They didn't interact at the time and uh, they didn't interact for some time, for a long time afterwards. Sort of the Boolean algebra idea, the idea that you could sort of mathematicize logic became what turned into things like the um, uh, the early concepts of computation from the 1920s and so on, and that's that's that thread. It is a formal, in a sense, mathematically inspired or formalization inspired kind of thread of thinking. And then there's the second thread, which is kind of the engineering thread, which is the thread that goes through Babbage and subsequent mechanical computers and winds up in the electronic computers of the 1940s and, and 1950s. So those are kind of two threads of history that were developing, and, and they developed in in a, in a sense quite separate ways. Some of the people involved overlapped, but most did not. Um, and in a sense, the the uh, the development of uh, of actual computing devices was in a sense not um, in in many ways not thought of as an intellectually formal pro process. It was thought of more as a engineering solution kind of thing, as opposed to more the mathematical logic side of things, which was thought of as very much of an intellectual kind of activity tied up with philosophy and, and mathematics and the foundations of mathematics and so on. Well, let's go back another 100 years. Uh, another 100 years back, we get to 1721. Uh, and at that time, uh, that was, uh, well, 
uh, Leibniz had just died. Newton was uh, was still alive. Um, it was those are those are some uh, notes from Leibniz. Um, that was the time when the uh, starting uh, well starting with Galileo in the mid 1600s, but leading into Newton in 1687 was the sort of mathematic mathematicization of science. Before that time, science had had a more kind of logical, structural approach to describing the world. At that time, the idea was, okay, write down mathematical formulas, start inventing calculus, things like this, and make uh, and describe the world mathematically. And that was, that was kind of the Newton tradition. Leibniz had a foot in that tradition, but also had a foot in another tradition, which was the tradition of kind of logic and philosophy and so on. And Leibniz kind of had this idea. Originally, the idea arose actually in his in his uh, PhD thesis was about um, uh, um, uh, resolving legal cases by turning them into logical argument, turning that logical argument into something mathematical, and or which could be mechanically uh, derived, and then being able to answer all of those kind of legal questions using a using a logic or ultimately mechanically. And Leibniz conceptualized things to the point that he realized one could in principle build in his conception a machine that would sort of grind out logical consequences and be able to sort of compute things. Now, you know, I went back a number of years ago and looked through Leibniz's archive, wondering if I would find an actual sort of image of a, of a theoretical computer. I did not. There were many images of practical computers built with cogs and so on. But um, Leibniz had conceptualized this idea of what he called the characteristica universalis, the kind of way of representing uh, everything using essentially mathematics and logic. And um, uh, this sort of universal language for representing these kinds of things. In many ways, he conceptualized things that uh, are very much like what we've tried to do with our computational language today. But he was hundreds of years too early to actually execute on those things. And the only distance he got to was to make a brass mechanical calculator. By the way, going back another 100 years, um, we get back, uh, this is from 1640s. Um, this is a a calculator made by Pascal, um, and uh, there had been a slight precursor to this. A few years earlier, a person called Chicard had made one of these, but made of wood and it didn't survive. The Pascal produced a whole a bunch of these Pascaline calculators. Um, these were uh, uh, mechanical uh, calculation tools. They were the sort of predecessors of the computers today. And so this one is from 1642. Uh, the, this particular one has been a little bit later, but but there were uh, examples of this from like 1640, 1642-ish uh, timeframe um, of, uh, of sort of these early mechanical calculators. Now, did these have a precursor? Well, actually they did. We know of one example, the Antikythera device from maybe first century BC, first century AD, um, the single example of a sort of mechanical clockwork computer, in that case, an astronomical computer found in a shipwreck around the, in the early 1900s. Um, the, uh, that, that device existed in antiquity. So there was, in a sense, the idea of computation, the idea of computers existed in antiquity. I kind of have this somewhat romantic view that is not completely unfounded in fact, that Archimedes was involved in the design or construction of things like the Antikythera device um, uh, and um, that, in a sense, he was sort of in the business of mechanizing the process of mathematics. But so there was this thread that goes uh, to some extent from the Antikythera device, although that thread is largely broken for 1,500 years, um, and, uh, and eventually winds up in the early kind of clockwork mechanical computers of the 1600s, which then turns into Babbage, in the 1830s, 1840s, although Babbage was not that well known, that then they're, they're then become it becomes commonplace to have mechanical uh, calculation devices. Certainly, when I was a kid, those still existed. Um, and uh, then electronics really comes in in a serious way in the 1940s, uh, turning into electronic computers. And electronic computers 
were, as I say, in a sense, directly derived from this tradition of kind of, uh, you know, mechanize the processes of calculation. So what happened with early electronic computers was then people said, let's make it easier to program the computer. Let's, um, and the computer had certain instructions and those instructions haven't changed much from the earliest computers to today. They are things like get data from memory, uh, add two numbers together, store data back in memory, jump to somewhere else in the program if something happens. Those are the underlying stuff of uh, of computers, and those have been the same for two thirds of a century. Um, what has happened is that people have been interested in, okay, we are humans, we are trying to get these computers to do what we want. How can we get that to happen? And the the, the kind of the, the early idea kind of based on sort of the way that computers were back in 1955 was, well, we have to provide a wrapper for humans to these operations that the computer is doing. We have to make it easier for humans to write down, instead of saying it's opcode 13 that uh, computes this or that kind of thing, we have to make it easier to, um, to have to, for humans to be able to tell the computer in its terms what to do. And that's essentially the concept of programming languages, the concept of Tell the computer, the computer has certain kinds of things. It has memory. You say, I'm going to lay out this data in the memory of the computer. Now I want to define this set of operations to do. I want to clump them all together into a subroutine, into a function that um, is going to be the way the computer does this. But it's very much a way of thinking about computation that's based on the, the kind of the way the computer's eye view of computation. If you were a computer, how would you intrinsically be thinking about these processes of computation? Well, I think that um, that has been in, in the tradition of programming languages, and there have been various waves of programming languages that have existed, both waves of programming languages and waves of attempts to teach people as kids, for example, programming languages uh, starting from the 1960s that was happening. Um, but it's had various waves of, of you know, let's, let's, develop these, these languages, again, always wrapped around what do computers intrinsically do? And I think that, um, uh, and, and, and one of the things that's happened is people have had more and more sophisticated programs that they are trying to write. And there, that has meant that the kind of, the bureaucracy of organizing what went from, oh, it'll be a program less than 200 lines long to its programs that are 50 million lines long, those require a kind of bureaucratic organization that works in a certain way. Now, the other thing that's happened is the ways that computers sort of express themselves to us has changed, most importantly, through graphical user interfaces. And there are certain ways of kind of describing what's happening in a graphical user interface that aren't quite as directly, the, 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 that represents another kind of thing whose state you're describing beyond the intrinsic state of a computer and its memory and so on. But in a sense, what we've done in what's now Wolfram Language, what we did with Mathematica, what I started doing with SMP, um, although I will say that if you'd asked me, is this what you're doing at the time, I would not have described it in quite these terms. What, what we were really doing is to think about things the other way, to start off with the idea of computation and then say, how can we represent the idea of computation in such a way that humans will be able to deal with it and ultimately in such a way that it can be implemented on a computer. But the implementation on a computer is kind of the infrastructure. It's not the part we care about. It's kind of like we're interested in writing great literature, but we're not gonna worry about the lead type that we're going to use to, to actually print it. We're dealing with things at the level of what is the literature you want to write rather than how should the, the lead type be arranged um, to, to make it, to print it in the best, best way. So in a sense, the way we've thought about kind of computational language is sort of an opposite to the way that programming languages have grown up. And we have been, I would say, I don't know whether it's completely a surprise, we have been unique in, in this effort. So programming languages have developed in the direction of make bigger and bigger wrappers around the particular things computers do, 
perhaps make libraries for particular operations people are interested in, but ultimately the language is all about what the computers intrinsically do. And what we've done is to kind of go from the other side, what do we care about in the world? How do we humans think about things? Let's try and represent that in the language and let's try to put into the language the knowledge of the world that we humans have, that is how we think about the world. It's not enough just to have the raw abstract specification of things. Instead, to talk about the world, we have to actually know about chemical elements or images or all these kinds of things. And so the work of the last third of a century, for me particularly, has been the design, the progressive casting of those, all of those different things that we care about in the world into this kind of computational form, into a form that can be represented in symbolic language. And I think it's an important activity. It's certainly an intellectually difficult activity, and I can kind of feel the progress that's being made as we understand yet another kind of thing that we can now cast in computational form. In a sense, the way that I think about what we're doing is we're sort of making a computational notation for representing the world. And in a sense, there's an important precursor for that. If we go back in the history that I was outlining, we went back in that history to the 1600s, and the, the mid-1600s was the great time of the introduction of, of modern mathematical notation of plus signs, equal signs, greater than signs, all these kinds of things. Before that time, mathematics had primarily been expressed in words, and it had been difficult to have sort of a streamlined elaborate specification or discussion in mathematics because it was a lot of words to do that and it was hard to kind of keep track of what was going on. But the invention of mathematical notation was what kind of launched what eventually became the mathematical paradigm, the understanding, the use of mathematics and science. It launched uh, uh, originally the development of, of algebra, then calculus, and then essentially all of the mathematical sciences which have been sort of the great paradigm that started in the 1600s for thinking about science. What one can think of our efforts in computational language today as being about is uh, to make a computational notation for thinking about everything that can be thought about computationally. And the computational paradigm, which I would say has emerged um, uh, on the scientific side, uh, my own efforts in the 1980s were perhaps important in that, um, to, uh, uh, to kind of get the idea of thinking in terms of programs rather than mathematical equations as the way to describe the world, but in general, to have this notion of using computation rather than mathematical formulas. This is the, 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 the computational paradigm is something that can, can inform all of these different areas. And so in a sense, what we can think about this computational notation, this computational language we've developed, that's about making providing the, the language, the notation for computational X, for all fields X, the computational versions of those fields. And I think it's something we're already seeing, we've seen over the last third of a century, a lot of kind of progress in those directions and the representation of those kinds of ideas in this kind of computational language notation, that's a very important thing. And we see that, that, that importance of that representation in many different ways. I see our computational language not only as a tool for computers to be able to represent and compute things, but also us as humans to be able to have a way to think about the, the things, things computationally. The process of casting something into the computational language is something which crispens up our own thinking about things at a computational level. And I think it's important as a way, computational language is important as a way for thinking as humans as well as a way for specifying to computers how they should uh, how they should work with something, and that shows up our notebook paradigm that we originally uh, introduced with version one of Mathematica back in 1988. The notebook paradigm is something which provides this mixture of kind of ordinary natural language text together with computational language, together with things like graphics and other forms of output from the computation. But that mixture is kind of a, a new form, now a third of a century old, form of communication of ideas that isn't just the text, isn't just the math formulas that you can read. It is the computational language, which both is a statement of kind of the computational representation of what's going on and something you can actually execute 
on a computer and do things with. And that's something that idea of computational notebooks, comp uh, which you can use to make computational essays, I think that's a crucial idea for kind of the development of the computational X fields, and in general, the spreading of the, the leverage you get from, from, from thinking about things computationally. I might say that from a point of view of things like education, thinking about things computationally is deeply clarifying. It is, if you, it's, it's kind of like, once you see something in computational language, worst case, you think like the computer and you say, what would it do? How would it take these pieces apart? And also a computational language, unlike something like a human language or even mathematical language is completely defined. It's something where you go look at the documentation for Wolfram language and it says, this is what such and such a function does. And you can look at examples of it, you can run it, you can do this, you can do that. You don't have to be like, well, the dictionary definition says this, but I'm not even sure if that's the right meaning in this case, or the mathematical symbol means this, but I have to go back and look in other places and I don't really know what it means. Computational language is anchored. It's a designed anchored thing. It's also a coherent language. It's not something that has kind of grown up by some sort of uh, random process of evolution. It's something that, well, I personally have been deeply involved in trying to keep unified and coherent and trying to make all the different pieces of the language fit together. And that's a critically important thing because it means that as we build, and in fact, we can see this in the last decade, particularly the, the rapid acceleration in our rate of innovation and our ability to add things to our computational language has been enabled by the fact that we have, that all the pieces that we have fit together. So we are able to just go in bigger jumps because we're able to use these, these stepping stones, these blocks that we've already created, we can build our tower taller at an ever, ever increasing rate because the bricks that we're using are bigger and bigger bricks. So that's been an important effect made possible by this kind of uh, uh, the, this effort over the last third of a century, actually more like 40 years, including SMP, 43 years now, to um, uh, 42 years, to, um, uh, to develop what's now what we think of as computational language. Now, I, I might make a few sort of other comments about this. One is that over time, it is a thing that's very common in the history of ideas, history of science, history of technology, that one gradually understands more clearly ideas one had before. For me, I have sort of alternated between doing basic science and doing technology development. Every one of those iterations has been important in helping my understanding. So back in, uh, I worked on physics. I, I, I then worked on developing SMP as a piece of technology. I then worked on developing things like cellular automata and early ideas of the kind of computational paradigm for modeling. That progression was made possible by that alternation. From physics, I learned the idea of kind of drilling down to find the primitives that would, you would use for a language. From developing the language, I got the idea that one could kind of meta model uh, things about models of the world and get to simpler models of the world that one could represent in terms of simple programs. Then from studying those kind of simple programs, I got more ideas about how one could develop a, a language, ultimately now our computational language. And um, then from having built the first version of Mathematica in 1988, uh, I have, well, I have always been for the last third of a century, I have been, I'm sure I'm not the biggest user of Wolfram language. I'm sure, I'm, I, I know of people in fact, who have the, uh, the, the enviable experience of being able to spend all of their time writing Wolfram language programs and so on, writing in computational language. Um, I, I don't get to spend all my time doing that, um, but I did get to spend a lot of time from 1991 to 2002 working on using uh, Wolfram language to do science, and that led to my big book, A New Kind of Science. Um, and that development led to the realization that it was possible to build something like Wolfram Alpha, which came out in 2009, and in fact, in a sense, contributed to this Cambrian explosion that I showed you earlier of realizing there are more things in the world that you can think of purely computationally than you might have imagined. 
And that was kind of an outgrowth of the work that I did in New Kind of Science. Then the practicality of Wolfram Alpha led to more thinking about kind of how one would develop uh, the, the kind of the, the ideas of computational language. And in a sense, that whole tower of concepts led us eventually to our physics project, which the physics project sort of goes all the way back to my early interests in physics, but through these ideas of computational language, the idea of simple programs, what they do, the idea of eventually technology and the development of things like graph manipulation capabilities, all these kinds of things, and then also reflects deeply on this notion of transformation rules for symbolic expressions, because the physics project, uh, in a sense, makes the whole universe, uh, the whole evolution of the whole universe, a notion of transformation rules on symbolic expressions. In a sense, in our model of physics, the universe, it's conveniently represented as a hypergraph, but it is ultimately an abstract symbolic expression. And the things that happen, the progress of time in the universe is represented by transformation rules for symbolic expressions. Now, again, in sort of the flow of history, I didn't really realize until after we developed that model, how directly related that model is to the original ideas of transformation rules for symbolic expressions, which had originally driven SMP and so on. Well, now in, in very recent times, I've kind of been going towards this idea of multi-computation, the idea that there is a paradigm for thinking about modeling things in the world that goes beyond the computational paradigm, beyond the paradigm that says, you write down a program with certain rules, you run the program, it goes from one state to the next to the next. It makes this kind of thread of time that is this, this kind of inexorable, irreducible computational thread of time that that idea, that's the characteristic of the computational paradigm developed in the 1980s and so on. I think there's a different kind of paradigm that we've seen glimmers of for a long time, for 100 years perhaps, but I think we now begin to see it really emerge in full form, the multi-computational paradigm, where instead of having that single thread of time and definite things happening, definite progression of rules, instead one has this kind of thing where different rules can be applied in, uh, uh, to make different threads of history. And the result is this kind of branching, merging picture of different threads of history with the feature that in order to say what happened in the world, you have to have an observer who is essentially conflating together different threads of history. Well, what, what's the significance of that? Well, one significance is that with that representation of the observer is in a sense a model of us that uh, and the representation of that underlying multi-computational system is, for example, a model of physics and the universe and so on. And what one realizes is that that multi-computational paradigm is what's needed to understand how gravity works, general relativity, quantum mechanics, et cetera. And it seems, and there's a very recent realization on my part, it seems that the multi-computational paradigm is something that gives one new raw material for modeling across a very wide range of areas of science, and technology, and it's potentially a very fertile new paradigm, kind of a fourth paradigm for thinking about theoretical science. Now, one of the things that I've realized as a result of thinking about the multi-computational paradigm is that we were awfully lucky with the development of SMP and Wolfram language, because in a sense, there is a morass of complexity that we did not encounter. Maybe I should say something, even in the level of the computational paradigm, where we're dealing with even very simple programs producing very complicated behavior. The question is, in that environment where even a very simple program can do very complicated things, the question is, how much of that computational universe of what programs do, do we want to capture in our computational language? We want to capture things about the world that we typically care about and talk about and think about and so on, but much of what happens in the wilds of the computational universe is complexity uh, reminiscent of what we see in nature, but far beyond what we would normally think about and care about. So in a sense, one sort of philosophical view of the role of computational language is it is this kind of beachhead in the computational universe of all possibilities. It is this region in the computational universe of, of all possibilities that is the part of that that we humans care about. It is our access point to the computational universe. It is, there is much that's in the computational universe 
Occasionally, we may mine other pieces of it to get things which are relevant for our technology or whatever else. But, but what we're interested in is having a language that describes those parts of the computational universe that we humans are actually interested in, in working with. Uh, and that's, in a sense, the role of our, of our computational language is to take the things we humans care about, the knowledge that exists in our civilization, and to take those things, package them up into this computational language, and then uh, get it to make use of the power of sort of what's possible computationally, which is represented by the computational universe, get it to make use of those parts of that power that we humans at this time in history actually care about. So that's kind of what I view sort of computational languages as bridge between human thinking and the kind of thing that's possible in the computational universe. Well, in the multi-computational world, there's, there's sort of this even more elaborate set of things that sort of happen in this multi-computational infrastructure. And we are forced, we as observers, with certain aspects of our consciousness, like being computationally bounded, uh, having a sort of a sequentialization of time, this idea that there is a single thread of time in our perception, in our experience, even though in the underlying physics, there might be all of these branching, merging uh, threads of time, that we sequentialize that somehow, that those things give us, well, they, they give us all sorts of features of multi-computation, sort of necessary uh, emergent laws from multi-computation. But how do we think about multi-computation and our observing of all these threads of time and so on? What we can think about that in terms of symbolic expressions and in terms of the old issue of transformation rules on symbolic expressions. What multi-computation is about is it's saying, given a symbolic expression, given transformation rules, apply those transformation rules in all possible ways and all possible sequences of ways. And in doing that, you potentially build up many threads of history of the different sequences of transformations that could be done by those transformation rules. But in Wolfram language, we're not doing that. We're instead essentially saying, just take the, the try applying these transformation rules and just apply, just use the first one that applies. And we're doing something else as well, which is if you just apply transformation rules to symbolic expressions, there's no guarantee that that process will ever terminate. It might just go on forever with producing more and more and more complicated stuff. But in Wolfram language, what we're thinking about is there is an input, there is an output. And we're saying you go from the input, you make a bunch of transformations, you get to the output. That is the operation of the system. We're doing, we're saying we're interested in those computations which terminate under that plus, plus procedure, that, that for which those transformations eventually, though you run out of transformations to do, you reach a fixed point, you get to an answer. So we're doing this thing about saying we're taking just this sort of one path of evaluation. That's different from what it seems that the universe does. It's different from what happens at some level in things like quantum mechanics in the universe, even in, even in space-time in the universe. With there, there are many paths that are being taken. However, we as observers of what's going on sort of conflate those things together and say there's definite history. There's a definite sequentialized history. So we're in a sense doing the reason that this model that we're using in Wolfram language is a sensible model for us is because that's what we humans eventually want to get out of things. We humans are not, uh, are not equipped to follow this sort of multi-computational process. However, what's interesting from the point of view of the design of a language is in principle, when you think about the language abstracted from humans, you would think I've got to follow all these multi-computational uh, threads and so on. And I did think about that in, in working on SMP. And I even tried to parameterize the different kind of threads of evaluation that you might follow, the different kind of evaluation orders, different kind of evaluation fronts that you might construct. And even in SMP language, there's some parameterization of that. It was incomprehensible to people, including to me. Um, it was never really used. People didn't care. It turns out that this fact that there's kind of this one thread of history is, which seems to be a, a core feature of our consciousness, is also something which we get to use in creating our language. So that's, but in a sense, it was a, almost a piece of luck that the original way that, that we developed this 
was such that we were kind of following that single thread of history and not worrying about all the other different possible threads of history. So it, um, uh, in a sense, that was a, a bullet dodged back in 1979 of, uh, you know, I did understand a certain amount, although not nearly as much as I do today, about what we would now call multi-computation or multi-way systems and so on. Um, but uh, I kind of pragmatically decided what we care about is this sort of single thread of history. And, and that's how the language was built. Now we're coming back and thinking about, well, how do we generalize that to think about multi-computation? And that's one of the exciting directions for the future. But I want to say that, that um, I think one of the things that in, in developing any kind of piece of practical technology, there's always the what you care about and what you don't care about. And you can end up going too far in the direction of saying, let's be very theoretical. Let's worry about all the different corner cases or let's be very practical. Let's just take computers as they are and build up from the sort of electronic structure of computers um, how things should work. What we've tried to do is to take kind of a middle road between those things that is really based on kind of the core ideas, these core intellectual ideas that date from, well, particularly a century ago and to some extent three centuries ago um, of, of kind of the, whether it's the Characteristica Universalis or whether it's the original mathematical logic kind of foundational ideas about computation, to go on the basis of those kinds of things and construct this, in a sense, formal structure. But then taking into account the fact that we want to connect that formal structure to actual things that we humans care about, and actual cities, and actual chemicals, and actual graphs, and so on. And, and to merge those two things together, to take sort of the foundations that have been understood as the result of sort of abstract thinking in our civilization, together with the knowledge that's been developed about real things in our civilization, together with kind of our impression of what humans actually care about wanting to deal with at this time in history. And that's something that gradually changes over, over the course of history. We get in developing our computational language to leverage on one very important thing, and that's human language. We get to take these lumps of computational work that we give names to, and those names end up being things that are based on words in English. And the fact that we give people sort of this cognitive anchor with which to understand our computational language is critical. If the names of our 7,000 functions were just numbers, you know, uh, function number 174 or something is applied to function 133 is applied to whatever, it would be extremely hard for humans to understand what was going on. In fact, from some of the early days of computation, the in 1920, the invention of combinators is something which, in a sense, our symbolic transformation rules idea is directly derived from combinators. But combinators go an even further step. They say, all these transformations you're doing do them on pure connectivity data. Do them only on information about where information flows in a system. Don't ever name anything. And that turns out to be not real good for us humans. Us humans, our way of thinking about things tends to involve this idea that there are permanent things that get names and those names have a sort of, uh, have a, uh, those names define kind of equivalence classes of objects that say it's a cat. So that means it has certain attributes and we can sort of conflate all those things together into that notion of a name. And, and that's um, and so that, that's kind of the, the, the thing that we are making use of in developing our language is that there is a pre-existing knowledge of those kind of names about things we care about in the world. And we're making use of those names to build up our language in such a way that, that humans understand it. So, if we look a little bit at um, kind of the uh, uh, the future of what what's what's going on, um, I think that the uh, the thing that I have realized is that you know we've been at this a third of a century. The core ideas that were in version one of Mathematica, I would say, have been well absorbed by the community of people, which have included many leading scientists, technologists, others over the years. The, the core of people who've understood those ideas and been able to take them a long way and invent and discover all kinds of things in that way, they have been able to take the ideas that we had a third of a century ago and really go amazing places with them. 
Um, I would say that the the sort of uh, the 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 full deployment of those ideas is only very slowly happening. I'm in a sense, as a student of the history of science, I'm not terribly surprised. Big ideas take a long time to diffuse out. It's it's much easier for something that, as I mentioned, the kind of the notion of sort of just wrap things around the mechanism of a computer, in a sense that goes all the way back to Pascal and, and Babbage and all this kind of thing. It's a, it's a continuous progression of sort of wrapping those things together. The, the idea, this kind of notion of sort of the pure computational language and so on, that's a much, much newer notion. That's a notion that really, well, in a, it, maybe it goes back to Leibniz, but in its form, of, its practical form, it's really something that we've just been seeing in this past We've just sort of developed in this past third of a century. And I think that that what we can expect is these, these ideas are kind of slowly diffusing out into the world. But the diffusion time is quite long. The diffusion time is more like a century than it is like a decade. Usually, so if we look at technology in general, you know, usually a decade is a long time for technology. In technology, sort of every, everything's changed in a decade. Now, of course, there are cycles to these things because there are moments when there's sort of rapid advances and there are long times where things are sort of slow down. And we're certainly seeing some slowing down in, in the development of computer technology. But the um, uh, in general, the idea, oh, it's a third of a century of, of, of sort of continuous development is that seems like a long time in the technology world, at least right now. Uh, in a sense, I view it as being a short time in terms of the development of, of formal ideas. And I think that development timescale is much longer, more, more like the century type timescale. And, and so we're only in the very early stages of, of the process of diffusing out those ideas. I think that I've, I've quite often described what we're doing as sort of building artifacts from the future. We're building things which inexorably will be the way that people think about things. This idea of computational language, there isn't really a question about whether that's going to be the way that everybody ends up thinking about things in terms of the computational paradigm. It, and there isn't really a question that the computational paradigm is the sort of the, the great paradigm of the 21st century and the thing that is sort of the next progression in, in intellectual development, just as the, it, 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 the kind of the mathematical paradigm from 300 years ago that was that was one such such paradigm now the computational paradigm is this new way of formalizing our thinking about the world and it's got tremendous power and has uh, tremendous mileage to go and we're still in its comparatively early stages of development i think that the as computational language gets more absorbed we will see the same phenomenon that we saw with mathematical notation 400 years ago to 300 years ago and so on, that that will enable people to think in those terms and build sort of taller towers on top of those ideas. But in a sense, what we're seeing with the development of, of computational language, uh, Wolfram language, is that we're seeing, we're, we're just seeing this tower of ideas get built and tower of technology be built. And it's very satisfying that the things that we built a third of a century ago in version one, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's pure, it's formal, and it's still there. And as I say, there's, we managed to maintain compatibility over that long period of time. Now, I think that um, if, we, if we say, what can we already see? What do we already know is going to happen? Well, typically what I've observed is that as we build up this tower, there's sort of about half the things that happen are things that we can readily see. We're on that path. We know that's going to happen. And half are things that only when we reach that level of the tower can we suddenly see this new site that allows us to, to realize something else and do something new and different. And I suppose there's another effect, which is the ambient technology and understanding in the world gradually feeds in to, to other things that we can do. But I think that um, when we look at, you know, we finished a few years ago, my 1991 to-do list, we are gradually working through our current to-do list. It'll be probably a decade before we've worked through the, the core elements even of our, of our current to-do list. 
These are things where there is a certain, it's a sort of a computational irreducibility story of a certain chain of things that have to be developed. People say, why don't you have this? Well, to do this, you have to have this chain of developments to make that possible. Now, one of the things that's been interesting to me is that we have sort of multiple levels of, of sort of uh, foundationness that we're able to do. The most foundational is things that are built into Wolfram language now and forever. We also have things like our function repository that allows us to have more rapidly deployed, less, uh, less for the ages kinds of capabilities that are just probably 50 times easier uh, to, to sort of get out than the core Wolfram language intended to last forever. We also have Wolfram Alpha, which is kind of doing smaller scale computations that has the ability to, to deal with things that are not as sort of pure and defined as the things that are needed for the language. But in any case, I think that the, um, the question of what will we see as we build the tower, there are things that are inexorable. There are things that we're sort of just working through where we're getting this bigger and bigger area that we're covering these bigger and bigger areas of knowledge. We've, we've I think, uh, really bitten into pretty much every uh, conceivable area there. We're now just chewing further, so to speak, to, to, get, um, to get all the pieces. But, um, and, you know, it's interesting for us to watch the development of fields and our developments in our ability to, to turn those fields into computational kinds of things. What we're seeing in most cases is that the rate of our computationalization vastly exceeds the intrinsic development of the field. And so that means it is not difficult for us to catch up and computationalize the field. And the field hopefully then will have a new kind of springboard to go much further, but it's not something where we say, oh my gosh, we'll never catch up. It's, uh, it's kind of like a, 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 a never ending process. No, it's just a question of time and building step by step and building out to cover all these different areas. And, and we've come a very, very, very long way in the last third of a century. And I think it's fair to say at this point that we have a, a truly full scale computational language. But now you might ask, what can, will we be able to see as we build the tower yet taller? I think there are uh, one, well, one example that has really just emerged is this idea of multi-computation and this kind of many consequence of that between distributed computing, logic programming, probabilistic programming, and many things that don't have names because they haven't been thought of before that are now becoming possible as a result of this idea of multi-computation. There are other things, the kind of the, the interaction of machine learning with our symbolic paradigm, the use of that to be able to help people write computational language. In other words, computational language is this precise way of expressing oneself, but in a sense, there's ways to make that be, make it be easier to, uh, to express oneself that way. Whether it's the equivalent of grammar checking, or whether it's the equivalent of kind of the instant feedback from almost a person-like entity that's kind of saying, did you really mean that? You know, is that really, now, you could have meant that, that is a possible valid piece of computational language, but it is more likely that you might have meant something different. So that, that's a sort of code assistance thing is another big direction. And there are, there are directions, another direction is meta-modeling of taking sort of all models of everything and really being able to say, what are the intrinsic computational primitives for, for the ways that those things work? And that's in a sense, a core idea of language design, but it's something where I think as we see these different kinds of models emerging from the computational paradigm, we can now go back and sort of meta model those models to understand what the primitives, you can write them using the primitives we have right now, but what are the cleanest and clearest primitives? Because in a sense that the critical thing here is that computational language defines a way for thinking about things computationally. So if we have a successful meta model with the correctly sculpted primitives, it helps people think about those kinds of things computationally. It's not merely a sort of service description of what's going on. It is actually a, a, a piece of raw material for thought. And much more so than with human languages, computational language really is something which supplies the raw material for thought when it comes to computational kinds of thinking. And, you know, I, I think the things that we'll see, you know, it's been watching sort of the progress of things like education. 
it's been a little bit of a frustrating thing because even from the beginning, a third of a century ago, we saw people very much understanding what was possible with kind of computational language and education, but it's been a slow process seeing that enter. You know, in the in the in the time since the the beginning of public education in most places, been a hundred years or so, a bit more than a hundred years. And you know, this this notion of of the computational paradigm, computational thinking, computational language, this is the first really big new conceptual thing to have come in after the period when people sort of set down the things to learn. And by the way, the things that one might have set down to learn in, in ancient Babylon, the, the, the topic list was pretty much the same as it is, uh, you know, as it, as it had been um, in, uh, uh, in, in sort of edu in, 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 in the standard curriculum of education of, you know, the reading, writing, arithmetic and beyond, so to speak, history, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these are things that really hadn't changed for a long time. We have a, a truly new paradigm in computation, and that's something that, that people have not yet really come to terms with how to, how to teach that paradigm. I think I, I view it as being kind of the computational method. How does one teach the computational method? And it's not teaching computer science. That's a different kind of thing. That's much more wrapped around programming languages, uh, some theory, but the theory is, I'm not sure, it depends where, where you are and what you're doing, whether, whether computer science even means the theory, or whether it really means just the, the, the craft of writing programs in programming languages and so on. It's not that. It's this different kind of thing. It's this computational method that is the way of thinking about things computationally, not the mechanics of how do you write code in a programming language, but instead, how do you conceptualize things computationally? And if we've done our job right in building our computational language, it becomes easy to go from that con computationally conceptualized idea to something you can actually represent in our computational language. So that, that's, um, that's a piece of it. Now, another, another piece of, of kind of what, what will happen as we, as we look to the future there's sort of a question of when we look at a practical computer, what can we take for granted comes with that computer? You know, back in the day, it was just the computer. Then it had an early programming language. Then it had an operating system. Then somewhat later, it started to have a user interface, networking, the ability to connect to the web, the accessibility of things on the web, et cetera. But now there's, there's this other thing, this kind of computational intelligence this computational language capability, and we're slowly uh, progressing at, um, at getting that to be sort of a standard feature of when you walk up to any computer. I will say that the, the computer um, on, oops, I have to figure out, no, I'm, I'm, it's very confusing for me. There we go. That, that, um, that computer, um, the next computer, Steve Jobs was, was quite visionary in realizing that bundling our computational language on that computer uh, would be something that would kind of raise the level of what you could expect a computer to be able to do. And um, that was uh, that's something where we're, we're sort of slowly seeing that level of vision creeping in in different places as kind of our computational language and computational intelligence gets included in more and more kinds of systems first at the more sort of drive-by level of, in, of intelligent assistance, and then more serious levels of, of various kinds of productivity tools, and eventually just a thing you come to expect of your computer. Now, over the course of time, one of the things that's happening is there are these different kind of deployment uh, uh, channels for our computational language from it's on a desktop computer, or it's on a, a batch processing server computer, or it's on a cloud computer, or it's on a mobile device, or it's on uh, something running as part of a blockchain, or maybe it's something running as part of an augmented reality system. Each of these different kind of form factors for the deployment of computational language leads to different kinds of interaction that we can have and different things that are worth thinking about in terms of the, the what's represented in the computational language. I would say that a general feature which I've increasingly realized about us and our science and our interaction with the world is that the science that we have is very much driven by the kinds of things that we measure and are sensitive to. And, and much science has been driven by the things that we readily can see with our eyes or whatever else, later with microscopes, telescopes, et cetera. But there's this sort of question, 
of what we care about is stuff that we can see that we're somehow sensitive to. And I think that as we get to see other kinds of devices, other kinds of, of things that reveal other aspects of the world to us, whether it's molecular scale kinds of things or, or other, other aspects of the world, that that will inform the kinds of things, the kinds of computations that we're interested in. And that I think will drive some of the future development of what's relevant for a computational language. Right now, describing molecular scale computation isn't something we know how to do, and it isn't something that, that there's a way to represent in computational language. Maybe in that particular case, it will be the computational language that leads the process of understanding how to do molecular scale computation. But in any case, the, the concept, you know, there's sort of a nano level of perception that can happen at the level of molecules. And once that is familiar, then there are things that we can think about doing that become things worth kind of plucking from the computational universe of possibilities and actually putting into a computational language that we humans get to use. But in any case, I think the, um, the, 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 for it's now, it's now by some calculation, it's, uh, we've hit that, um, that third of a century since the original announcement of Mathematica and Wolfram language and, um, I would, would say that I think we are, uh, uh, that might, a third of a century might seem like an eternity as far as many kinds of technology are concerned. But I consider that the, the things that we've built are just getting started. We built this very big tower. We built a tower that in a sense is, is pokes far into the future, you know, at least 50 years into the future in terms of, of what the expectations are and much longer in terms of, 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 uh, of, of creating something that is kind of a formal structure that is kind of a, a, a timeless permanent formal structure. But in any case that, um, so I, I see that as being the, the thing that's been achieved over this last third of a century is the building of that tall tower. And now it's really the, the sort of one of the great challenges is to turn that tower into something which is, is, is widely deployed in the world and widely understood and where it's possible for, for the, the vast mass of people to be able to make use of what we built in the best possible way. And that's, that's kind of a, as I say, it's, it's, a, it's a feature of bigger ideas that they take a long time to diffuse in the world. And, and that's what we're seeing here. And it's worth realizing that in a sense, what we're doing is, I mentioned kind of the, the 1955, another one third of the century back to the early days of electronic computers, I would say that what we're doing is much more a reflection of the next third of a century back, or maybe three centuries ago, of kind of the early ideas about sort of formal ideas about this notion of computation. But so, anyway, it's been a it's been a um, uh, a great kind of um, uh, a great experience this last third of a century. It's been great uh, having the opportunity to really try to have a vehicle in which one can understand things with the clarity that's needed to build computational language. It's kind of a requires a clarity of understanding of different areas greater than one that I've that that exists anywhere else. Um, that's kind of the and that that being being sort of uh, uh, having the opportunity to 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 explore all these different areas and trying to turn them into computational language, use what we learn from computational language to do still more has been a, a wonderful experience over the years. The, in recent times, I've been live streaming some of those experiences, but it's been, those been great experiences to have. I also want to say that it's been a, a great pleasure to see all of the different um, things that people have done. We, we know about only some tiny fraction of the achievements that people have had with Mathematica and Wolfram language over this last third of a century. We uh, uh, was, uh, uh, we 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 have a chance to only see some parts of that, and um, uh, but it's been it's been uh, quite quite wonderful to see that. Um, I think perhaps I have um, uh, um, uh, the the um, I think the uh, uh, it's 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 kind of uh, I think we've been particularly fortunate that the people who have we have we have. Uh, provided a tool which I think has been very widely used among some of the most productive and innovative people in the world. And that, in a sense, uh, has it, it's been very satisfying to see our tool be used 
to with with such leverage by such people to achieve all all sorts of remarkable things. Well, I think that um, uh, that's perhaps pretty much all I all I wanted to say here. Um, we can perhaps look a little bit at some of the things that were part of the history of. Um, I just just flash up a few things that are kind of fun. Um, that uh, from history here. Uh, that was our very first startup screen. This was some. Um, uh, this was a an early poster made um, uh, by Apple, um, promoting Mathematica on the Mac. Um, it's kind of fun to see sort of early brochures that we made talking about different kinds of things and uh, our kind of early understanding of what um, uh, what could be done. Uh, there's a price list of Mathematica version two showing the diverse creatures that existed in the, in the world of computer hardware at that time. Um, there are uh, uh, other, that was the first book um, that had a, a CD-ROM with actual notebooks that were computable documents in it. Um, the, uh, then we've got, uh, well, that was our first website um, back in 1994. And then by 1996, we already had a website called The Integrator, which was kind of a forerunner of Wolfram Alpha and um, uh, a forerunner of our cloud-based computing um, solutions. We had a, a variety of other deployment vehicles. This was a thing for a um, uh, 1997 um, tour of the US and, and Europe, the Mathmobile, a, um, a, a roving uh, demo center uh, for Wolfram Language. Um, and uh, uh, perhaps, and, and back in the day, when, uh, when one used to do physical talks, that was a, a big uh, tour that I did back in, um, when was that, 1991, um, talking about, maybe I should do one of these again, I don't know. People should tell us. Um, the, uh, if we go um, uh, still uh, further back, where well, we have uh, all the early registration cards, and actually, we are about to do something. We did this uh, the 25th anniversary of Mathematica. We sent out, um, sent to people who we could find some, um, uh, sent them copies of their early registration cards again to kind of remind them about the things that had uh, had happened in those those intervening years. Um, and uh, um, I think um, maybe we should end with uh, the what might have been. These were, um, uh, boy, that's a DOS file there. This is 1987, perhaps possible product names. And this was before the Mathematica name, which had been a, a name we thought about, and Steve Jobs encouraged that name. And these were, we, we went through, there was an early name, Omega. That was an early um, uh, um, uh, possible name. So we've, in a sense, gone from, in, in going to Wolfram Alpha, we've gone from Omega to Alpha. Um, but uh, if we might um, look at um, uh, the um, uh, uh, at some of the names, which many of which became names for other products in the intervening in the intervening years, uh, including these ones like uh, Mathosaurus and Igor and Mathdroid down at the bottom here, that I listed as some impossible product names. But it's kind of fun to see what what might have been there. Um, anyway, so I think um, we should. Uh, uh, wrap this up. There's a poster that was made um, right around the um, original introduction of, um, of, the, of the system. And um, um, uh, yeah, well, I think, um, I don't think this is probably the time for, for, for questions. And um, um, I think I should, uh, should just leave it there. And um, um, I don't know what the one third of a century cake should look like. Um, I think, uh, uh, but um, as of now, well, by at least some calculation, Mathematica is a third of a century old. And um, uh, I'm very proud of what it's become over that period of time. Well, thanks very much. And uh, bye for now.